Hello everyone. So welcome to the second session of the genomic variant analysis and clinical interpretation course. Today we'll be learning about next generation sequencing and understanding population genomics. So just to recap, in your session one, you would have encountered concepts of basic genetics. You would have also understood principles of inheritance and also understood a basic prelude to genomics. So let's begin by looking at what is a genome and then go on to understanding how do we look and study genomes using next generation sequencing and other sequencing technologies and how do we apply this information to understand population scale genomics. So let us begin. Uh, so the first topic that we'll be discussing is the overview of a genome. So to understand this, almost every one of you would have heard that what a genome is and almost most of you also know that the human genome is sequenced. But how do we understand what is a human genome? So let's go back a bit and, and, and look at the human body for a minute. So each human has approximately 37 trillion cells and each one of your cell knows exactly what to do and it functions how it has to function. For example, a liver cell knows that it has to remove toxins from your body. A brain cell knows that it has to store memories. How do these cells do what they have to do? How are they so good at their job? So you can understand the genome as a language or a code that, that encodes a set of instructions that tells each and every cell of your body to do what it has to do and eventually build up a whole human being and make a unique you. So if we zoom into each cell and within each nucleus, we can see that we have compact condensed structures known as chromosomes and within this chromosomes lies our genetic material that is a deoxyribonucleic acid, also known as DNA, and it is a double helical long stretch of um, a long long molecule that consists of a stretch of letters which are only four in number. That is A, T, G, and C. However, these chromosomes that we inherit from our parents are twenty three pairs of chromosomes. So one pair is inherited from the mother, while the other is inherited from the father. And eventually, we land up with three point three billion base pairs, which comprises of your entire genome. So genome is nothing but a complete set of DNA. Basically, all the genetic instructions for you to grow, develop and function. If we look uh, deeper into what the DNA structure consists of, DNA structure consists of a uh, double helical molecule in which complementary bases are present on each strand. So these complementary base pairing occurs via adenine binds with T, uh, thiamine. So basically A binds complementary to T and G binds complementary to C. Now A binds complementary to T via a double hydrogen bond and G binds com complementary to C via a triple hydrogen bond. Now these uh, bases are not just present as bases, they are present as nucleotides and nucleotides can Consist of three parts. One is your sugar moiety, one is your phosphate moiety, and one is your base. So bases are four in number, that is A, T, G, and C. These are also known as nucleobases. While when it has to form a nucleotide, it gets attached to a sugar moiety and a phosphate moiety. Now, sugar moiety also has a hydroxyl group, which is very important in polymerization of these nucleotides and takes part in the formation of something known as a phosphodiester bond. That is the bond present between two, two nu adjacent nucleotides. While each strand nucleotides binds to the opposite strand via a complementary hydrogen bonding that is A to T and G to C as I've already mentioned. So the backbone of the DNA molecule is the sugar phosphate backbone while the nucleobases that are present in the nucleotide project towards the inside of the double helical structure. All right. So now uh, now, how do we understand how does this information is encoded, right? Like I've said that each cell knows what it has to do. It knows its job. So how does this information get 
uh, gets uh, interpreted from the genome so to understand this let's take an analogy of a recipe book so now each recipe book consists of a numerous kind of numerous number of recipes and numerous kind of recipes but if we have to make a chocolate cake we definitely go on to our individual recipe of a chocolate cake pick out that recipe from the book and then eventually use those ingredients and perform certain um, perform certain actions or using the recipe and then eventually our chocolate cake is made so similarly in biology dna is your genetic code that consists of a new that consists of numerous recipes basically for different kinds of proteins which are required by different kinds of cells now each code has to be interpreted in a certain form so basically to get your individual recipe you have to form individual rnas so each D, uh, so from dna you have different kinds of rnas and each rna gives rise to a protein which protein is basically the um, actionable form where you basically see so if if i say that i have blue eyes versus you have red eyes so that means that you have a particular color you have a particular protein which is responsible for giving you a particular color of the eye so basically the information goes flows from dna it gets trans transcribed into rna through a process called as transcription and then this information or the coding potential of rna is translated into a protein that is your basically an actionable product and that happens via the process of translation and within transcription you have transcription machineries that are used that is a polymerase is used and you have number of different helicases or different number of proteins that are required to convert dna to rna and a different kind of translational machinery which involves structures like ribosomes to which eventually help in converting rna to your protein so uh, to understand this in terms of nucleotides and dna let's understand this that dna gets converted to rna via the process of transcription and from mrna a protein is made via a process of translation now this protein is a uh, is consists of a consists of a chain of amino acids so this is known as polypeptide and each amino acid is in turn coded by a three letter code that is a three letter nucleotide code that is also known as a codon so each three letter code corresponds to one amino acid and many amino acids when coming together as a polypeptide forms a protein so for example in this particular protein we have a pol four uh, we have four amino acids forming one protein that is asparagine proline glycine and threonine so initially when the central dogma was described it described it uh, it described the process of flow of sequential information only via a one way process that dna gets formed to mrna and mrna gets formed to protein but with um, with better understanding of biology now we have now we know that dna also self replicates itself that is how the dna gets it's passed on into generations so there is a process that is replication that dna as a mole biological molecule can also self replicate itself and also in certain uh, retroviral vectors it's been seen that there is an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase that can give rise to dna from mrna so our initial central dogma said that dna forms rna rna forms protein but now we also know that mrna can also give rise to dna via a process known as reverse transcription and that happens in certain retroviral vectors so since these two um, phenomena were not described in the initial central dogma that was described they are known as it as its exceptions okay so now to understand better about the central dogma let's uh, zoom into uh, a particular set of gene okay so now in if we zoom into gene c we can read something some blocks that are readable and there are some certain blocks which are colored in gray which are marked by certain special characters so these are not readable by us right so we can only read this uh, second panel as emily something makes something red something right so 
from our genetic code that is our dna our dna consists of certain blocks which are readable and certain blocks which are not readable now when we have to make a coding potential that is when we have to convert dna to rna or when we have to transcribe rna from dna what happens is these blocks which are not very readable to us are also known as introns okay these do not get uh, transcribed into rna and are not encoded in the protein so we we, we do not actually need this need these so the only um, parts that get coded or get transcribed into rna are the ones that are readable to us for now so uh, these are known as exons and they are interspersed between them by something known as introns which are non uh, presently not uh, coding however there is a lot of research that is happening to what exactly does do these introns contain and a lot of regulatory information is coming out out of introns so um for now we know that introns don't get coded into proteins so now we have to only uh, so these introns when the process of transcription occurs only exons are retained and introns get uh, spliced out via a process known as splicing so introns get spliced out and only the exons are retained so from dna when we make rna we get something known as emily makes red choco cake every day now this information is interpreted by the uh, by us that we need to make a chocolate cake and so eventually a product which is a chocolate cake gets made so the event uh, eventually the product that gets made is our protein so from dna we went to rna and from rna we went on to our final product that is our chocolate cake now to understand mutations so mutations are nothing but some mistakes that happen in the dna all right now these mistakes can happen randomly over evolution can be sporadic in nature or can occur due to some agents mutational uh, mutation causing agents or also happen um, naturally within the cell via a process known as recombination as you would have already understood in the first lecture that there are certain mistakes that happen during the process of cell division and also randomly that can um, bring about changes within our genomes right now how do how do we understand this mutations so again let's go back to look at our dna which was emily something makes something and uh, assume that there are three mutations that are happening so let's look at the first scenario that is the left panel and assume that there is a mutation which is marked by this lightning uh, symbol that there is one mutation that occurs in the intron 1 and there is one mutation that occurs in the exon 2 so we have one mutation occurring here and we have one mutation occurring here now since i already told you that this block is not going to get transcribed into our mrna right so we don't don't really uh, this mutation doesn't really affect us much because it's eventually not going to come in our mrna so let's not look at this but let's look at this condition where the mutation is happening in an exon which is going to get transcribed into an mrna so if the mutation is m gets converted to b so now the coding potential that is going to get transcribed or the mrna that is that we are going to make from this dna is going to read as emily bakes red choco cake every day instead of what would have happened if the mutation wouldn't have occurred would be emily makes red choco cake every day now these two these two interpreted mrnas or basically the coding potential that has got generated eventually gives rise to or makes sense that we have to eventually make a red choco cake every day right so it was it the coding potential that got made even after the mutation is still similar to what was our original coding potential so again a chocolate cake is still made but let's look at the second scenario which is in the right panel that if a mutation occurs in this exon that is coding going to code for cake all right now if the mutation is a letter a gets converted to letter o now what are we going to read in the mrna instead of emily makes red choco cake every day now it reads the code as emily makes red choco coke every day 
now you understand that the meaning of our coding potential has completely changed instead of a cake now we are asking it to make a coke and hence our product end product that we had expected to be a cake will now not be a cake but will be a coke so because of one change because of a single letter change that happened in one exon the whole code whole coding potential interpretation got changed and a new product or a different product is formed now similarly in cases of diseases also certain proteins that we expect to form do not get formed or in some diseases similar proteins get formed as uh, like we saw in the first case so even with mutations certain proteins still can function but when certain mutations occur proteins cannot function in a similar way instead a different protein is formed which is also a uh, cause for many biological diseases that we see so let's look at this in the genomic architecture uh, point of view so uh, just to recap human genome consists of 23 pairs of chromosomes and we just now saw that a structure of gene consists of exons which are going to get coded into rna while introns that get spliced out during the process of transcription so uh, let's look at two genes that is uh, gene 1 and gene 2 now gene 1 consists of uh, exon 1 2 and 3 while gene 2 consists of four exons and between genes um, we have something known as intergenic region all right now this uh, gene 1 is going to get uh, transcribed into e1 e2 and e3 and similarly e1 e2 and e3 let's say in the uh, let's say that uh, gene 1 gets transcribed and it has three let's look at three scenarios one where there is no mutation one where a mutation occurs in the first exon of the um, rna and one where um, sorry the mutation occurs in the dna so let's assume that a mutation has occurred in the exon 1 and that mutation is also uh, get has also got transcribed into rna and another mutation that is a different type of mutation that also occurs within the exon 1 all right so similarly like we saw in the cake example that first uh, case is going to give us a healthy protein while a particular type of mutation is going to get tolerated and still result in a healthy protein but a different type of mutation at the same position can also lead to a diseased form of the protein all right so like we understood that certain mutations can get tolerated within our human genome and certain mutations cannot now how do we go about looking at which is this mutation or which is this mutation and how do we figure out that where is this mutation or what is the mutation even right so uh, genome sequencing is a technique that is now employed to look at such mutations or basically read each and every nucleotide within your genome and figure out where such problems arise and so that this helps us in understanding diseases better so basically genome sequencing is to read each and every letter of your entire genetic code but if we if we look at a case where we take let's say 10 bases a minute and read out uh, 600 uh, so basically if we read 10 bases a minute we'll read 600 bases an hour even if we read single single base at such a speed like i just mentioned it will still take us 9.5 years to read out aloud our entire genome without stopping so is it even really possible to read out a book read out our entire genome for 9.5 years it's really not right so what we what we do is let uh, what we do in genome sequencing let me explain it to you with one more example let's assume we have 200 copies of a particular date of a newspaper as we can see in this all right now if i shred this newspaper apart and 
make a lot of pieces of this uh, these copies of uh, newspapers and now ask you to assemble one particular right hand uh, corner article that i want that was my favorite article and i ask you to reassemble it from these pieces of um, newspapers is it actually possible so it, even if it is possible do we have so much of time to sit and uh, sit and assemble all this or is sequencing as simple as reading a book so it's it's not as simple as it looks or it seems like so what we actually do in genome sequencing is fragment basically we cannot read our entire genome at a stretch it is it is not possible with the technologies that are available so what we do is we fragment our dna into a um, into multiple fragments and then sequence each fragment and then these are usually overlapping fragments so when we sequence uh, each fragment we then assemble uh, overlapping fragments and the pieces of the genome and then eventually build the entire genome after reassembling each and every overlapping fragment so the point that i'm trying to say is genome sequencing is not as simple as just reading out letters of your entire genome it is a complex and it is a time consuming process that has evolved over the years that we'll now understand how so if we look if we go back to 1953 1953 was the time when uh, james watson and crick uh, developed the dna structure based on x ray crystallographic structures from uh, rosalind franklin and following that in towards 1977 gene uh, sanger sequencing was developed which was the first technique wherein we could sequence small fragments of dna we we'll look at sanger sequencing in a bit more detail in a uh, in a while but just to give you an overview of what all types of sequencing exist there are basically three uh, major classes of sequencing or three generations of sequencing as it is better known as so the first generation of sequencing was uh, was from the advent of sanger sequencing to the completion of uh, the human genome project that happened in 2003 and from uh, 2005 the advent of next generation sequencing or the second generation of sequencing has occurred till uh, approximately close to about 2015 second next generation sequencing or uh, second generation sequencing is still used today however advent of a third generation sequencing has also occurred from 2015 so these three generations are divided into uh, they uh, divided into further two more classes based on the size of the fragments that they generate uh, so there is a short read sequencing that is uh, that encompasses the first and the second generation and the third generation that is now coming up is based on the long read sequencing so uh, within the long read sequencing we can actually sequence tens to kbs of a kbs of a fragment at one go while in the short uh, short read sequencing we can um, read from 50 to close to about 1000 base pair fragments in the first generation while 50 to 500 base pair fragments in the second generation so three generations of sequencing encompassed into two types of chemistry that is short read sequencing long read sequencing the first and the second fall into the short read sequencing while the third generation comprises of long read sequencing all right so now let's look at um, sanger sequencing which was the first type of sequencing that was developed in the 1970 uh, 1970s by a scientist known as uh, frederick sanger and uh, what he um, Uh, what he explained was that uh, if we have a double stranded dna and we want to sequence uh, he incorporated a special chemical with a special chemically modified nucleotides so uh, let's look at this first a uh, panel where my pointer is pointing so when we have a double stranded dna we denature both the strands and each strand gets new uh, gets a complementary newly synthesized strand so uh, the dark blue color or this particular small stretch of nucleotides that you can see are nothing but complementary nucleotides to our template strand so the light blue strand is our template strand so let's imagine a t g and c to be the first four letters of our template strand so the primer that you are going to add or this short nucleotide sequence uh, or oligomer that you can see that i'm saying gets added are nothing but if there is a you have a t 
as the first um, base of the primer. If you have T as the second uh, template strand uh, base, you have an A on the complementary primer strand. So basically your primer is the complementary sequence to the initial uh, few nucleotides of your template DNA so that it comes and binds via complementary base pairing to your template DNA. Once your primer binds, there is an enzyme which is marked again by a color of blue in this figure that comes and sits on your primer and starts, this is known as DNA polymerase. And now this polymerase is going to add more nucleotides when we put in the pool of nucleotides that is G, A, T and C and each nucleotide is going to get added and in this, in this figure, you, where my pointer is pointing, you can see that from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, primer up post the primer attachment, we can see that the synthesis of the new strand of DNA is, has already begun via the incorporation of nucleotides. But what Frederick Sanger did was, he incorporated a chemically modified nucleotide as well. So when this chemically modified nucleotide gets added, the polymerization stops because uh, it does not allow the formation of the phosphodiester bond that uh, has to happen. And when this uh, polymerization stops, what you eventually land up with is, you land up with different lengths of fragments with a different uh, um, uh, last nucleotide which is the chemically modified nucleotide that gets added. So when we have different fragments, so this incorporation is based on uh, uh, is based on the concentration of normal nucleotides versus chemically modified nucleotides and once we have this uh, stretch of overlapping fragments within our sample, we then eventually um, allow the DNA sample to pass through a detector and via laser these uh, these basically these chemically modified uh, nucleotides also have a fluorescent stack and once this uh, once they are detected by the laser you get something known as a chromatogram and based on the color of the fluorescent stack you see a chromatogram which has different four different colors corresponding to each nucleotide so um, this color is for G, red is for A, blue is for C, and G is for T in this figure. So based on the chromatogram, you get your DNA sequence that was present in your uh, template strand. And uh, it is eventually, um, it is eventually uh, converted into the nucleotide sequence via software, and you uh, finally get your uh, desired template sequence. So this was the earlier most uh, technique that was used uh, in 1970s. So the uh, figure or the explanation that I've given you right now is is of the automated capillary sequencing, which is the most advanced form of Sanger sequencing. So initially when Sanger sequencing was developed, it did not happen in a single tube. It happened in four different tubes and each tube had a different concentration of nucleotides versus one particular chemically modified nucleotide. So a chemically modified nucleotide A was added in the first tube followed by each in the separate tubes and once the samples were run they were actually radioactively labeled and an auto radio uh, and an x-ray was placed on the gel and an auto radiogram was generated and then the nucleotide sequence was deciphered but with the advent of technologies now we have uh, gone to a level where a single capillary tube can um, and by addition of differently fluorescent tags on each nucleotide, we can do it in a single tube. And based on this automated laser capturing, we get the nucleotide sequence in the form of a chromatogram. And now the technology has become very easy. Um, even with the advent of newer technologies, as we learn further on, Sanger sequencing still remains the gold standard to go back and confirm uh, any short nucleotide sequence uh, sequencing that we have to do, short stretch of DNA sequencing that we have to do. So uh, Sanger sequencing is still the gold standard that we have to go for any confirmatory analysis in genomics that we do. All right. So let's now look at um, the important um, technique that was uh, that came up in 1983s, which was developed by Carrie Mullis, and this is a technique to amplify your DNA. Basically, make multiple copies of your DNA uh, strand. So again, you start with your template uh, DNA, which is uh, shown uh, by my laser pointer, and with varying temperatures. So you take the temperature uh, from your room temperature to close to about 94 degrees Celsius, and you denature DNA. You uh, separate the strands into two single-stranded 
forms and then again anneal primers at a temperature of, of close to about 45 to 55 degree celsius and then extend these primers with the uh, addition of polymerase and nucleotides and what you get is an amplified product so from one molecule you basically land up with uh, two molecules so if you have hundreds of molecules here you will land up with a much more amplified product so this technique was very important for newer techniques to use this technique and build upon and improve their sequencing technologies and also this comes very handy in picture when you have a starting amount of material that you want to sequence is very low so you basically amplify your starting material and then sequence because most of the sequencing technologies do incorporate a loss in your uh, genomic sample so uh, to incorporate or to cope up with the loss of uh, starting material that we face, we even first amplify our DNA and take a larger starting material so that even if loss occurs, we have a good amount of um, uh, good amount of product that uh, that is processed, which can eventually go into sequencing. So PCR was a very important uh, technique that came up in 1980s, and uh, towards the 1990s there was a massive um, massive endeavor to sequence the entire human genome so this was not a very easy task it took over two decades so the human genome project started in 1990 and got completed in 2003 so it took two decades and over a three billion dollars basically 13 years and it took hundreds of scientists across dozens of countries to come together to not only sequence the entire human genome for the very first time, but also sequence genomes of bacteria, yeast, worm, fruit fly, mouse, etc. And when, once the entire human genome was sequenced, it came up to be known as the human reference genome sequence which we still use to compare uh, a patient's DNA or to compare a population uh, level DNA to a reference genome, basically to identify variations or changes or things that differ from a standard reference genome. So uh, even though we say that human reference genome is something that we use to compare, we, it is very important to remember that this is not a single person's genome or it is not an exact match of one person's human genome. Uh, the human genome project consisted of samples from a number of donors and uh, eventually all the sequences were compiled together to give up to uh, give a one human reference genome and there are different builds to human reference genome so the earlier versions were hg18 hg19 and now we have the hg38 version so with uh, more and more human genomes that are getting sequenced we identify more so when the initial human reference genome was sequenced there were a lot of gaps within the entire human genome that we did not know what they coded for but with more and more betterment of technology now we have actually covered those gaps and more and more number of genes are getting discovered so with um, with each version of the human reference genome or with uh, something that is known as the human genome build we are actually coming close to understanding the human genome in a better uh, coverage and in a better form so even the human genome was uh, a, seek, a human genome project that happened sequenced 99% of a gene containing part of the human sequence and it was finished up to 99.99% accuracy and overall 3.7 million uh, mapped human single nucleotide polymorphisms were identified. What are these SNPs? We'll come to that in a bit. But the human genome project was a massive endeavor that eventually helped us and paved the way for a lot of betterment in a lot more different fields that we'll see how it has impacted the fields of biology technology and even human medicine for that matter so uh, when we talk about impacts of human genome like i said it has impacted field of biology wherein systems biology as a field has emerged so um, we have started to understand the human body in parts it's not only uh, 
it's not only the entire genome now we know that these are the genes that are involved and these are the regulatory elements that are involved so uh, we have started to understand it in parts and a new field called as systems biology is emerging and an application of this field is the encode project that happened uh, further on we also have multi omics that are now coming up in picture where we not only look at genomics per se we also look at transcriptomics we also look at uh, uh proteomics so we also look at the entire protein content we also look at the entire rna content to understand uh, what are the roles or how are these inter um, inter mingled with each other and how does it entirely how does the entire uh, human or how does an entire human function based on um, basically we're trying to understand all this using a multi omics approach so this could only happen once the entire human genome reference dna was available to us and not only uh, in fields of biology uh, with respect to systems biology and multi omics approach we are also trying we have also understood migration and human an evolution better by looking at ancestral sequences or by comparing it to other population level dna sequences we have we have understood where do each chunk of our dna comes from right so this has been the impact in terms of the biology field and also because such a massive scale of dna uh, human genome project that occurred we have also uh, started using our technology better and it has given rise to two uh, two major uh, streams of sciences within technology with respect to biology that is computational sciences or bioinformatics and also looking at big data sciences wherein we look at multiple number of genomes and since this uh, these genomes are not um, smaller in size we look we are looking at whole genome sequences we are looking at whole exome sequences so uh, a lot more computational and a lot more bioinformatic approach has started to emerge which has given rise to two different fields where now uh, people with computer science background can also look at genomes and also and try to look at uh, try to look at um, biology and understand human genomes better and eventually in the field of medicine uh, like like i already mentioned that we have a human reference genome sequence now when we can when we compare our patient's dna or any other person's dna with respect to the human reference genome we can actually look at what are the places within the human reference genome that eventually lead to a variation or lead to a change which eventually does it even cause a disease or does it not cause a disease so uh, like like we like we saw in the previous slides that not every mutation or every variation or every change in the um, nucleotide sequence is going to lead to a defective protein or is eventually going to establish causality so such studies and uh, especially in cases of medicine and disease biology has um, started to emerge only once the human reference genome sequence was available to us and um, certain projects like hapmap project and the thousand genome project which we'll look at in future slides have paved way for genome wide association studies so let's uh, let's look at um, each of these in detail but before we go to the impacts let's understand two major concepts that um, that, um, that first let's look at um, variants or changes from the human reference genome sequence so on the y axis is the effect size or the amount of population that gets affected by uh, these variants and on the x axis is the uh, frequency at which these variants occur so by very rare i mean that no a very small chunk of the population is going to consist of this consists of these variants and when we look at undetectable variants let's say for example it basically represents a very small population size and they are very 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 rare in nature right so if we look at 100 people let's say only one or uh, let's say if we look at 1000 people one person is going to carry that mutation so the population effect size is also very low and the frequency at which the nucleotide occurs is also very low so so there are different classes of variants that um, 
play a role and there are two major types of diseases in which these uh, variations play a role so now first is the mendelian variants wherein um, if we look at a mendelian inheritance in a disease we uh, we say that if so basically mendelian diseases are the diseases where we have one gene and a mutation in that gene is going to cause one disease all right now uh, these are already known specific genes which are already known to be implicated in a certain disease and these follow a specific pattern of inheritance that could be autosomal dominant that could be autosomal recessive or x linked in uh, x linked dominant or x linked recessive and we could also have de novo variants but uh, basically we should have these variants in one gene and that is going to lead to one disease however there is another set of diseases which are complex diseases so they usually have problems such as penetrance issues they have expressivity issues and not one gene is involved in a particular phenotype uh, not uh, not there are multiple genes that have an interplay between them and lead to a complex phenotype and there is also a role of environmental factors or epigenetic factors that take uh, take place and due to a combined effect we see a complex phenotype so the, those are known as complex diseases while mendelian diseases are very easy to identify so mendelian variants that i am talking about are very rare again but they affect a high population size whereas when we look at common disease variants they are very common and they also affect a low uh, effect size but if we have common variants which also affect a very high number of population they are unlikely disease variants right because uh, if i say that there is a particular variant in in more in a lot more a uh, number of people in a population and if all those people are healthy that means it's very well tolerated in the population and it is very unlikely that that particular variant is going to cause a disease in a uh, particular individual while uh, the same variant is not going to cause an uh, disease in a particular individual so um, in cases of penetrance and expressivity issues this can happen but when a particular variant has a very large allele frequency or what we say is as a population allele frequency then it is very unlikely that if a particular variant has a very high frequency in a uh, in a population it is going to be responsible for any kind of disease all right so again to reiterate the same fact that um, if if we look at two individuals genetically speaking 99.9% of these two individuals are going to be same but the uh, hair color or or let's say the hair length or let's say eye color or skin color these are phenotypically these are going to be different and these differences are only a 0.1% between two uh, between any two individuals and these variants that occur between two individuals are known as single nucleotide polymorphisms and they are known as polymorphisms only when they affect more than 1% of the population so 1% cut off is used for um, variants to be identified as disease causing variants if they are below 1% population but if they affect more than 1% populations they are known as polymorphisms and they are very less likely or they they are not really uh, correlated with the causality of the disease so these single nucleotide polymorphisms occur in our human body every 300 nucleotides and if we look uh, now extrapolate this we can say that there are approximately 10 million single nucleotide polymorphisms in a in a person's human genome now within this 10 million which is the one variant or which is one um, which are the set of variants that are going to uh, you know you are going to associate it with a particular disease is something that is a challenge and we we'll look at uh, how do we go about uh, solving this challenge in future slides so um, we saw that the impact uh, now we have to understand what was the impact of um, the human genome project that was a big endeavor to sequence the entire human reference genome in terms of biology and technology so there were two major uh, population scale genomic studies that came up which was the international hapmap project 
which took up to 269 samples from four different populations. So the entire uh, concept of the HapMap project was to look at common single nucleotide polymorphisms that exist between individuals and then eventually build up haplotype blocks, basically find out regions within your uh, genome. So what these people did was that they found out chunks within your genome that are inherited together and these are common SNPs. So they build up blocks of common SNPs and that helped help them in understanding population level um, differences between individuals. And then uh, after the HapMap project came up the Thousand Genomes Phase 3 project. Uh, it was basically in Phase 1, 2 and 3. In the final phase, they sequenced 2,504 individuals, which came from 26 populations, and they cataloged uh, common as well as rare uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So SNPs are basically common, while rare variants exist, and they also covered. Low, they also uh, cataloged these using low coverage whole exome and whole genome sequencing. So when I say whole exome and whole genome, uh, if you remember, I told you that only the exons are the coding regions uh, of your uh, of your which get incorporated and which get transcribed into rna which eventually gets translated into proteins so basically the coding region of your dna lies within the exons so since uh, whole genome sequencing is a very huge task and we are eventually going to look at disease causing variants in proteins or basically uh, understand which are the defective or non functional proteins that are leading to a particular disease what we first do is only sequence the coding regions of your DNA, which is whole exome sequencing. Basically, sequence only the exonic parts of your DNA. So how we do this is we capture only the exonic part within the DNA and then sequence only that part. Whereas whole genome sequencing is done where, uh, where we entirely sequence the entire uh, human genome. And uh, in during this process of Thousand Genomes Phase 3 uh, project also, they cataloged close to about 88 million variants. And not only single nucleotide variants where a particular one nucleotide differs from a reference genome with respect to a person's genome, but they also cataloged a number of different types of variants like indels, wherein there could be insertions of a stretch of nucleotides or a particular um, um, region of nucleotides that gets incorporated as an insertion or a particular region gets deleted. So that is known as indels. And then there could also be structural variations that uh, play a role wherein you, uh, bigger chunks of uh, DNA get, get translocated or inserted or rearranged in a particular manner, which also leads to uh, defective proteins in the end and uh, eventually leads to a uh, particular disease phenotype. So uh, both of these projects paved way for uh, a technique known as uh, genome-wide association studies, which employ uh, the concept of DNA microarrays. So uh, DNA microarrays are nothing but looking at two different um, expression profiles of a healthy cell versus a pathological cell to understand what are the differences that make a cell healthy versus a cell, a pathological cell. So when I say that a cell is a pathological cell, of course, there are some proteins which are defective in that cell, right? Now to understand that, what they do is they take two, uh, they take both the cell types, healthy cell and pathological cell, and RNA is isolated from both these cells. And reverse transcription into DNA. If you remember, I told you that we can uh, we can make DNA from RNA using the process of reverse transcription. So once RNA is isolated, they are reverse transcribed into DNA and fluorescent tags are, are attached to each of these um, DNA uh, that gets formed after reverse transcription. And then there is a chip on which complementary, uh, complement, so these are basically common uh, common places of your genome where you want to look at whether a particular mutation has occurred, whether a particular change has occurred or not, right? So basically you want to probe that, okay, this is a pathological cell, this is a healthy cell, so does this X mutation is present in this or pre not present in this, right? So uh, to do that, you have 
you already have complementary sequences of these probes onto your chip which is nothing but a, a it, it looks like a common glass slide and within the glass slide you have a certain um, regions where these complementary uh, bases are already present now once you put your sample on it if the pre if the mutation is present or not present it goes and hybridizes and a fluorescent signal is emitted now based on the signal that gets emitted you can find out whether uh, like for example if it's a gray signal you say that that signal is not present in cells if it's green it's present only in normal cells whereas so on and so forth so once you analyze such data you find out and you basically can build expression profiles or signature profiles of a healthy cell versus a pathological cell and now these have paved way to more advanced technologies like snp based genotyping so for a particular snp you can actually find out whether the sample consists of a heterozygous form of that snp or a homozygous form as you would have understood in the first lecture that every snp has um, three forms so it could be present in homozygous recessive form it could be present in homozygous dominant form or it could be present in the heterozygous form so let's say a a is the homozygous recessive form a uh, b b is the homozygous dominant form and a b is the heterozygous type so now with the advent of newer technologies like snp based genotyping we can actually identify whether a particular snp is homozygous recessive present in a cell homozygous dominant present in a cell or is present in an heterozygous form and once we look at uh, such data as we can eventually do something known as uh, genome wide association studies wherein we correlate such specific genetic variants with disease risk of varying statistical significance and these are based on case versus control comparisons and such uh, with the advent of dna microarrays and uh, newer techniques the um, increase in such genome wide association studies have been immense and uh, post 2005 there have been close to more than 1000 publications that have come up based on gvas but the main problem that still occurs in gvas is that the results can be difficult to interpret because the um, actual disease causing variant might be rare and the sample size of the study might be too small or the disease phenotype might not be very well stratified and also what fraction of the thousands of gvas hits are signals versus what fraction is a noise is still a concern so um now whole exome and whole genome sequencing basically uh, are coming up uh, in uh, in the newer technologies and it has paved way to look at pharmacogenomics basically looking at uh, each uh, drug versus their adverse reaction and looking at individual profiles and identifying uh, giving rise to a field known as personalized medicine wherein uh, each of the drug that is prescribed to you will be looked at your uh, pharmacogenomic profile in the first case and seen whether you carry a variant that could lead to an adverse drug reaction so this drug will not be prescribed to you an alternative drug will be prescribed to you now there could be clinically actionable variants for example braca variants which we already know can cause breast cancer or predispose you to uh, certain types of cancer right so if you already know pre happy um, uh, if you already know uh, um if you already know or you can preempt that you are going to be predisposed to a particular type of cancer and for which there is a clinically actionable uh, action that can occur um with the advent of these newer techniques we can also identify them and also look at those and uh, probably take actions that we need to take and then uh, eventually it has also paved way to you know uh, look at drugs and therapies for cancer driving mutations and has helped in uh, developing or taking drugs to a newer level and devising also better therapies for uh, these 
uh, cancer driving mutations. So if we look at the second generation of sequencing, now that we have understood the first generation of sequencing, post human genome project, uh, these technologies have also advanced and the second generation of sequencing, which is also known as next generation sequencing, consists of basically four steps. So the first step is library preparation. So uh, once we have the DNA sample with us, like I already said that uh, it is difficult to read the entire uh, genome at a stretch. So what we do is we fragment uh, these, um, uh, uh, fragment our DNA and form multiple uh, fragments of the DNA. Now, uh, since this technology that we are now using can be massively paral parallelized. What I mean by this is we can do multiple samples at one time. But now to differentiate uh, these multiple samples at one time, what we have to do is we have to add specific tags. And also the uh, chemistry behind this is that you, when you have a flow cell, basically the Flow cell is the device that goes in your sequencer and library is something that you make from your sample that gets added onto, the uh, onto your flow cell, which eventually goes in the sequencer and the sequencing is carried out and data is generated. So on your flow cells, the chemistry of next generation sequencing is that it occurs sequencing by synthesis, all right? So uh, when we add specific tags that are adapters and indexes, we massively parallelize the whole process and on your flow cells are complementary sequences on, of these specific tags that you add. So basically to event, uh, eventually parallelize a lot of sequencing that you can do at one go, you add uh, um, sequences of adapters and indexes. And once you add these, they eventually go on to uh, get, go on to something that uh, has to happen that is hybridization and clonal amplification. So clonal amplification helps in uh, better um, enhancement of the signal and also one particular fragment gets sequenced multiple times so you get a better coverage and depth. So to understand this better, let's look at this, how cluster generation happens. So this is your flow cell and eventually your DNA gets added and then this is your polymerase that is going to synthesize a newer strand. Now each strand will get again separated and again go and attach and then the whole process gets repeated. All right. Now, how does clonal amplification happens? Let's look at another uh, example that both of these strands now again get bridge amplified to another complementary adjacent adapter sequence and multiple such copies are generated. And then such multiple copies that get generated, as you can see in this video, it's, is it, it's going to amplify the signal and help in better detection. And once sequencing is once sequencing occurs and detection happens, what you get is something known as something that you can see here. You get a stretch of nucleotides that are present in each fragment. So each fragment's DNA, you will have multiple copies of the same sequence which is coming up from one fragment. Now, if we do forward read and reverse read, basically read the fragment from one end and the opposite end both to get a better coverage of your um, sequence that is present, we eventually land up with a, with a lot of fragments that are overlapping also in nature. And then eventually assembly is done using very highly specialized bioinformatics softwares. And then your entire human reference genome is constructed, which is then compared to the reference genome and then analyzed to look for variants. So, so with the advent of um, uh, the such technologies, the there has been a dramatic increase in the rise of data output that has um, happened since 2000 and also the concurrent falling of the cost of the genome sequencing has occurred. So when the Human Genome Project was done, it was close to about $13 billion. But now in a couple of thousands of dollars, we can actually sequence the entire human genome, which is again uh, set to fall 
further with the betterment of technologies that we are up to and also the capacity to sequence all the 3.2 billion bases of the entire human genome has increased exponentially since the 1990s and close to about 2014 now there have been multiple number of uh, human genomes that have been sequenced and if we look at the data from 2014 there were 18000 genomes that were sequenced annually and these are only going to increase and have only been increasing since 2014 even up till now and uh, we expect that and experts predict that uh, human genome sequencing is eventually going to be the routine um, care of practice in clinics as well once the cost and the technology is better so uh, having said all of this and you know understanding that sequencing is going to help us in understanding disease biology what are the major challenges that we face today in the process of next generation sequencing and understanding um diseases better so uh, like i uh, like i already said just to um, probably um, recap we have uh, an individual whose dna we have to isolate and then probably do a library prep and sequence so now we have so many variants that uh, so we'll have a number of reads that are going to come with dna sequences that we are going to have now we are going to assemble it and probably align it to the reference genome and look for variations now we are eventually going to land up with variants let's say for example g gets converted to c or there is a G, gt insertion that happens at a particular place so such variants that we eventually land up with after doing a specialized series of bioinformatic pipelines that is done after the process of sequencing we land up with 100 million gen genomic variants in humans and now these genomic variants are coming from 20000 odd genes that are present in the human genome so there are too many variants however most of these variants are going to be harmless or are going to be polymorphisms that are going to um, be present just to make uh, just to be the basic differences between two individuals but there are going to be few disease causing variants which are going to be clinically very relevant to us now the major problem is how do we find our needle in this whole haystack how do we find out or how do we pinpoint to those set of variants that we think are clinically relevant to our set of disease so this is the major challenge that we are currently facing so um just to uh, leave you with the process of bioinformatic analysis that we do we are going to look at uh, how what are the different types of variants that we get after sequencing how do we basically annotate this variants and how do we um, eventually like i said how do we get to the needle of from the haystack of variants that we have is something that we look at in the future lecture but uh, just to conclude we after sequencing we have an output file and that gets converted into a fast q file that consists of all the reads consisting of all your uh, sequence data now we have to do a sort of pre processing of the file and then form an alignment file where we overlap all our fragments that we have sequenced into one uh, genome ref genome Uh, file and then compare it with the uh, human reference genome and then look at the variants and eventually form something known as a VCF that is the variant calling file wherein this is the human reference genome and this is our genome or the patient's genome and we compare each position and look for variants so here as we see G to C has is a variant so in your VCF you will only have chromosome and the position and the reference allele and the alternative allele so in this case let's say this is chromosome 1 and position 100 so in your vcf file i want to have 1 100 g and c so g is your reference allele that means the allele that is present in your reference genome while c is the alternative allele or the mutated allele that is present in your sample genome all right but how do we know which gene is it or how do we know that is it an intronic variant or an exonic variant or how do we know what type of mutation has occurred for all this we have to do a lot more analysis post getting the vcf and then eventually link it or um, 
understand it with the context of clinical um, clinically relevant disease so basically the disease that we are looking at we'll have to apply or interpret it using the clinical context of the disease that we'll look at in the futures uh, future coming lectures so i hope that this lecture has made you understand from where did we even begin sequencing what were the initial techniques of sequencing that we used and even after the advent of next generation sequencing where is the exact challenge that we are facing and how do we uh, now start understanding variants and how do we interpret variants and how do we start looking at the cl clinical relevance of these variants with respect to diseases is something that we'll be covering in the future slides so thank you for paying attention and i hope that this video and this lecture was helpful to you thank you